So now we're moving from one of the most productive fishes in the uh, Great Lakes and St. Lawrence to what to me is one of the scarier subjects that we talk about at Save the River, and it's Asian carp. Our speaker today is Chad Lord, who serves as the policy director for Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition, where he develops and guides the implementation of the coalition's legislative and policy agenda in Washington, D.C. Before joining the Howe Coalition, Chad served for five years as a senior legislative assistant for U.S. Representative Betty McCollum in Minnesota. And Chad's portfolio includes energy, environment, transportation, international trade, and budget and appropriations. And Chad was raised in southwest Minnesota, so he can understand what the North Country is like in the middle of the winter. Chad? Thank you, John, for that nice introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I very much appreciated the invitation to come and talk to you about a really important issue. First, though, I just I want to say how particularly excited I'm to, be, I'm to be here because I've never been to this part of the Great Lakes. I've never actually seen the St. Lawrence River, even though having been doing Great Lakes work for almost 15 years now. So I'm really excited. I'm also really excited to come back. I've heard some really wonderful stories about how beautiful this place is in the summer. So I'll be back with my family. And as John noted, I did grow up in southwest Minnesota, um, and I have to say the weather does make me feel right at home, so I do appreciate that hospitality. Thank you. Um, as John noted, my name is Chad Lord, and I am the policy director for the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition. And for those of you who don't know us, um, our coalition came together in 2005 to fight for Great Lakes restoration funding. Uh, we now have over 150 non-governmental partners, and we are still fighting to ensure that the federal government continues to be a good partner for our region in helping to protect and restore a drinking water source for not just three, 330 million Americans, but millions of Canadians as well. Our partnership among our coalition members, between our coalition members and various levels of government, has resulted in nearly $3 billion of restoration funding that has come to this region. There are many problems facing our Great Lakes. We just heard about a couple of them in this particular part of the basin today. The one I'm gonna focus on is Asian carp. Yes, that is, I did not come up with that, but I do think it's pretty funny. So um, I'm gonna to try to describe to this, to this afternoon, you know, try to describe these fish to you, um, actually fish is, because we're not just talking about one, um, where they come from or where they came from, um, to be more precise. I want to summarize why they are such a threat to the Great Lakes, and I want to talk about what actions have already been taken. I'm also going to try and give a little bit of an overview of the steps that still we think need to be taken in order to prevent their invasion. And then I want to end on a call to, uh, of action. Um, I think John already set that up nicely by directing your attention to the petition on your tables, but there are a couple of other things that we think we need to do. First, though, I have to acknowledge that much like the region's CARP response, this presentation is the result of, result of collaboration. Many of the slides, including this one um, I'm using today, were graciously donated for my use by good friends and partners like Molly Flanagan with the Alliance for the Great Lakes, Mark Smith with the National Wildlife Federation, and Mark Gaden at the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. So let's talk about these fish, or as I already noted, fishes, because there are Asian carp is not just one fish. There are actually four different species. There are um, grass carp, black carp, big head carp, and silver carp. Most of the conversation around these fish tends to be, at least in the Great Lakes, tends to be focused on silver and big head, although there is increasing discussion on grass carp. Black carp, however, at least in the Great Lakes, aren't discussed as much, um, at least not yet. So. What are these fish, or who are these fish? Well, the grass carp, and I honestly, I'm not a scientist. I don't know what kind of carp that is. <laughs> so we'll just call that carp all four. Um, this grass carp was imported. Grass carp was, was imported, and this is a key, this is gonna be key to all of these fish, imported into the United States. This one was the earliest, 1963, and it was by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They were stocked to biologically control aquatic invasive plants, such as hydrilla and Eurasian water milfoil. 
Grass carp like shallow, quiet waters, and they easily tolerate waters near freezing. Grass carp initially escaped from Arkansas, which is where most of these um, fish were originally um, brought into, and have since spread across the country, including, they have been found in the Great Lakes, although they have not been found to have established any breeding populations. Black carp also arrived in the United States, but 10 years later, so 1973, these fish were imported as the only biological agent to control non-native snails in catfish aquaculture ponds, ponds, again in the south, Arkansas and Mississippi. Interestingly, they were also originally seen as a potential sterile biological control agent for zebra mussels. Black carp like the, bot like, the, black carp like deep, the bottoms of deep rivers. And because of this, sampling to determine their distribution has been incomplete since they're just more difficult to find. And so we just don't know much about their distribution range. But we do know that black carp feed primarily on mussels and snails, and there are concerns that they will harm native mollusks, many of which are listed as threatened and endangered under the Endangered Species Act here in the United States. Silver carp were brought in with black carp in 1973, again in Arkansas, and, it was a, and again it was aquaculture. This species has been used to control phytoplankton in nutrient-rich water bodies, but unlike big headed carp, according to the research I read from the Congressional Research Service, that silver carp haven't really proved as suitable for U.S. aquaculture and have really never been widely used for it. But as you'll see later, these fish, and as, as, as you'll see, um, these fish are confined mostly to the Mississippi River Basin so far, and there is no record of capture of these fish in the Great Lakes. Silver carp are filter feeders. Uh, they're capable of consuming large amounts of phytoplankton, zooplankton, and other detritus, and they're easily startled by outboard motors causing them to jump. These are the famous jumping fish you may have seen videos on in YouTube. And big head carp rounds us out on the four. Um, also brought in in 1973, that was the year I was born, so it was a great year mostly, I guess. Um, but along with silver and black carp, big head carp were brought into the United States, again, Arkansas, again, aquaculture. These fish apparently proved suitable for aquaculture and continue to be economically important in the South. Um, but, and like silver carp, big head carp typically require, lar typically require large rivers for spawning, but they do inhabit lakes, backwaters, reservoirs, and other low current areas during most of their life cycle. They too are filter feeders and they consume primarily phytoplankton and zooplankton. And you're probably thinking, well, why did I go through all of that? Well, because I want you to start planting them in mind as you begin to think about your resources here and whether or not these fish could come here, because guess what? They can. So carp were brought to the United States, albeit with good intentions to help southern aquaculture. However, in the 80s and 90s, they escaped into the wild after major flooding events inundated those, farming, those farms. And I lived through some of those um, Midwest farms. Those floods were pretty, pretty wild. And so they've been migrating north, south, east, and west ever since. And they've not only been migrating, they've been migrating quickly. So if they escaped in the 90s, that's been about 20 years, give or take, my math. And so here's the distribution of big head carp. And you can see over the last 20 years, they have scattered throughout the entire, mostly the entire Mississippi River Basin. Um, they've been moving up the Ohio River. Kentucky and Tennessee are now calling, are now paying close attention to what's going on. They've been moving up the Missouri River, Iowa, the Dakotas. You can see that they've also gotten up into the Twin Cities. And so they have scattered pretty, pretty, pretty wide distribution over the last 20 years. And here's silver carp, not quite as wide, but still following the, the same basic path of these river systems. They have moved far and fast, these, as these maps show, and are right on the border of the Great Lakes. So why are they such a threat? Well, here are, um, for starters, risk assessments done by the U.S. Department of the Interior and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada have indicated that Asian carp are certain to tolerate the Great Lakes, Great Lakes Basin's climate. So the top map is their natural native range in Southeast Asia. The bottom, wrap, the bottom map is kind of the similar range in North America and you can see the Great Lakes fit well within that. Asian, Asian carp populations will do well in much of the United States and Canada, um, which does include the Great Lakes. So they have been able to easily settle into their new home without all that much trouble, as you saw on the previous slides. 
Other binational assessments also have demonstrated that because the habitat is so similar, or because the climate range is so similar to their natural home, that these fish can spread easily, which we've already seen, that they can find good homes in the lakes and their tributaries, the Great Lakes and their tributaries, and that it actually might not take all that many fish to establish a permanent population. Okay, so fish can live in the Great Lakes, so what? Well, we should be worried for a number of reasons. As I, you know, as I already noted, at least two of the species, silver and bighead, they're eating machines. They feed continuously. They, they're plankivores, and they eat up all the zooplankton and phytoplankton, which is really important for native fish. They basically out-eat everything else. They reproduce and develop quickly. Silver carp females can produce one million eggs in a year. By comparison, you know, other native species produce a fraction of that. They quickly grow and become too large for, for predators. So they eat, they grow, they reproduce, they outcompete. And we've seen it before. Asian carp have left a trail of destruction in the Mississippi River system that has harmed the ecosystem, the economy, property, boaters. Between 1991 and 2000, as scientists watched the Asian carp spread in the Mississippi and Illinois rivers, Asian carp abundances, abundances surged exponentially. Between 1994 and 1997, the commercial catch of bighead carp in the Mississippi River increased from 5.5 tons, this is in three years, 5.5 tons to 55 tons. And that's in the 90s. Today, commercial fishers in the Illinois River regularly, regularly catch up to 25,000 pounds of bighead and silver carp per day. Half an acre of river can often yield thousands of pounds of Asian carp, a remarkably large amount of fish. The commercial, the biological impacts clearly are severe, but so too are the economic ones. The commercial value of Asian carp is quite low, and it's much less valuable than the native fish they replace. And not only that, as already noted, silver carp, when, when scared, are, easily, are, are easily startled by the sound of boat motors. And the sound causes them to leap as high as 10 feet out of the water, earning them the nickname as the flying fish. Some of these fish weigh more than 20 pounds. They land in boats, damage property, they injure people. The Great Lakes Commission has estimated that nearly one million boats and personal watercraft operate in the Great Lakes, which thereby places millions of people in potential contact with silver carp. And I understand that there are probably a lot of them right here in Clayton. Knowing the hazards of boating, jet skiing, and water skiing on the Illinois River system, the problem of projectile fish would be compounded on the Great Lakes by a significantly larger boating population in the region. So the ecological devastation that could be caused by these fish would destroy an environment that we're already trying to protect and restore, as we've heard about today, and thereby radically affect the region's economy, an economy that supports a seven billion native fishery, millions of boaters, as already noted, and other economic activity that's generated by the charter boat operations that make tens of thousands of charter trips in the Great Lakes region every year. And perhaps to add insult to injury, our importation of these fish isn't the only decision we have made that has added to the Asian carp threat. Before the 19th and 20th centuries, the Great Lakes were generally speaking, and this is like over like generalizing, but generally sealed, were generally sealed from aquatic invasive species. That changed when our nation began developing technology and infrastructure that has allowed non-native creatures to jump the watershed divides. Here in the Eastern Basin, the canals, the St. Lawrence Seaway, the connection around Niagara Falls between the lakes Ontario and Erie have allowed new species to jump natural barriers and spread faster and further than before. In the Western Basin, the subcontinental divide near Chicago, which kept the Great Lakes and Mississippi River watershed separate, also was ultimately breached, as Peter talked about earlier today. I should note that Chicago and here between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario aren't the only interbasin connections. There are a number of those, and you can see them here um, that have been identified. But you know, as when we talk about Asian carp, there is really one, on only one, that has been identified as been been probably the top priority um, and the top connection. We need to talk about Chicago. So before the end of the 19th century, Chicago, as noted, straddled the subcontinental divide. Chicago has always been a city, 
that has gotten its drinking water from Lake Michigan, and until the end of the 20th century, Lake Michigan, as already noted too, is where it disposed of its waste. You know, I think it's interesting. Upton Sinclair wrote in the jungle about the Chicago River. He said, Bubbly Creek is an arm of the Chicago River and forms the southern boundary of the yards. All the drainage of the square mile of packing houses empties into it, so that it is really a great open sewer of a hundred or two feet wide. The filth stays there forever and a day. The grease and chemicals that are poured into it undergo all sorts of strange transformations, which, is, which are the cause of its name. It is constantly in motion as if huge fish were feeding in it, or great leviathans disporting themselves in its depths. I think Peter mentioned that there were chickens that could walk across it as well. Um, so anyways, that was the state of Chicago's waterways. And recognizing a public health crisis that's caused when a growing city starts drinking its wastewater effluent, city leaders undertook one of the largest engineering feats of its time. They decided to re-engineer a river so it would flow the other way. And Chicago did. They did exactly what they set out to do. They redirected the flow of its river west, so instead it would suck all that water out of Lake Michigan and send it to the Gulf of Mexico. The flow of the Chicago River was reversed, and the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal was born, creating an open link for Asian carp and other native species, invasive species, to move between the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes for the first time. Ultimately, this is what they created. So this was before, and that was after. Thus, the actions of the late 1800s to deal with a terrible public health, deal with terrible public health issues, also created a direct connection between the two basins that would come back to haunt us. When the water, the water quality improved, and things could actually live in these canals. And guess what? Haunt us, they have. As already noted, Asian carp have been swimming towards Lake Michigan ever since they escaped their fish farms two decades ago, and they are now very close. As you can see, let's see if I can get this to work. All right, so Brandon Road, Lock and Dam, which I don't know if all of you can see, is kind of down here on the lower right. Um, fish are all the way up to there, and then on the left side, you can see all those pur purple dots, and that's where individual fish, or at least evidence of fish, have been discovered. So you can see they are very close to Lake Michigan. So what's being done to stop them? Well, it didn't take long for people to understand the threat of carp posed to the Great Lakes. However, the response to carp actually started from a different direction. It's interesting that in 1996, Congress directed the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers to find a way to prevent the, the, the dispersal of invasive species from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River. The concern was foreign species going east to west, not west to east. Think of the zebra and quagga mussels. What came out of the 1996 Congressional Directive, however, was the construction. However, the solution that to that to the solution to that problem, that the solution that was proposed for that problem ultimately proved useful to keep Asian carp at bay as well. What came out of the 1996 Congressional Directive was the construction of the electric barrier system in the Chicago waterway system. It took a while for construction to begin, but the first of the three barriers have been were completed in 2002. Another barrier came online in 2009, and a third barrier was recently made part of the system. So that's a diagram of the, uh, the second barrier that was constructed, so you can get a feel. So it's basically big, big wires that run underneath this channel, which was man-made, um, creating an electric field in water. So <laughs> unless you don't want to swim here, but not only do you not want to swim in this water, the fish also don't like it because the electric field creates, makes it very uncomfortable. So the big fish, when they swim up, actually have been seen to come up, get shocked, and then they turn around and go back. Um, there's three of these barriers now to create redundancy so they can take barriers down and do maintenance. Something to keep in mind, which I think is really important, once we have an invasive species, it takes a lot of money to deal with it. Anyways, this barrier system, recent budget request from the Army Corps of Engineers, it is estimated that its annual operating cost, annual operating costs for these barriers is around $17 million a year. That's mostly for electricity, which they produce right next door, by the way. It's really, um, so anyways, even with the barrier system, concerns spiked in 2009 when Asian carp DNA began to be found 
between the new barriers in Lake Michigan. So all those purple dots, we began to see evidence of Asian carp between what was supposed to prevent them from getting into Lake Michigan. So we had now them between that barrier and Lake Michigan. eDNA was a new technology, but it, and it, but it was enough to spark panic that more had to be done to keep Asian carp out of the Great Lakes. So while many states and organizations called, called for the complete hydrological reseparation of the Mississippi River from the Great Lakes in the Chicago and federal government, it, from the Great Lakes, in Chicago, the federal government organized a different, although vigorous, multi-agency and in some ways interim response. The, a multi-agency Asian carp rapid response work group first came together in 2009 to implement response plan in light of a positive uh, in light of the positive Asian carp DNA um, within the waterway system the Asian carp regional coordinating committee which is up on the screen was formally established in early 2010 and it still and it still exists and represents the collective efforts of international federal state and municipal partners to combat the spread of Asian carp into the Great Lakes the committee is comprised of numerous federal agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Coast Guard, states like Michigan, Illinois, and uh, Minnesota are part of it, as well as other governmental bodies. Even Canada pays attention and is involved. For example, in 2018, the government of Canada has committed $20 million over five years to its Great Lakes Asian carb work. Canada is also a member of the ACRCC. Since that time, there has been a lot of work that's been ongoing. Every year, a new Asian carp monitoring and response plan is published, outlining the steps that each ACRCC partner will undertake, how it's going to be funded, um, and the types of things that um, they do include how carp will be monitored throughout the basin, in particular Chicago, what steps will be taken if new fish are actually found, um, other non-structural control activities like overfishing and netting and other things to reduce the populations, and who is going to be involved. It also spells out a pretty aggressive research agenda on a number of interesting and novel technologies for control or elimination. But even with the national coordination, Congress, was, Congress has still been concerned and recognized that a more permanent solution had to be found. So in a bill, the Water Resources Development Act that Congress passed in 2007, it actually directed the Corps of Engineers to undertake a study, the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Interbasin Study, or Glimmeris, to evaluate potential options to prevent and, or reduce the spread of all aquatic invasive species between the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes. That study was done in 2013. And from the beginning, the study differed in a couple of key ways from traditional core studies. First, it analyzed an array of potential alternatives, but it did not recommend a specific plan. And that is going to be important in a moment when I start talking to you about Brandon Road. Second, it did not include an environmental impact statement usually required for federal construction projects under NEPA. It did not also include a breakdown expected cost share responsibilities between the federal government and local sponsors. And regardless of its novel approach, the Glimmer study described, regardless of all of that, Glimmer still did describe um, eight alternatives, that, um, including a no-action alternative, to prevent interbasin transfers of aquatic invasive species like Asian carp. Glimmer's primary focus was on Chicago, and its options range from, a, from minimal changes to the current monitoring and rapid response approach to major structural changes to the waterway system, to complete hydrologic separation of the two systems. However, as I noted, Glimmeris is not technically actionable by Congress. Congress authorizes major construction projects by the US Army Corps of Engineers, and Glimmeris wasn't actionable by, the, by Congress. And so the Army Corps had to take another project, undertake a project that, where they would provide more information on a, on a preferred approach, identify a non-federal sponsor, um, refine cost estimates and provide the environmental analysis before Congress could authorize its con um, a construction of a project. In order to move towards a project that Congress could actually support, the Army Corps moved to refine its options at a particular site that the Glimmeris report had identified as promising location to control one-way movement of carp upstream. And this is Brandon Road. Brandon Road's dam, the, the, the height of Brandon Road's dam was identified as a natural barrier preventing Asian carp from potentially swimming or jumping upstream, which makes the adjacent lock to the dam the only a good place to potentially do, uh, to take action to prevent carp from transiting that location. So in thinking, the thinking was that if you can propose control technologies that you can put in that lock chamber, 
you could prevent or reduce the carp that's downriver from continuing its migration towards Lake Michigan. The Brandon Road study had, was started quite a while ago, actually, and its final draft was finally published and released late last year, and it's now open for public comment, although it still remains unfinished. So just a little bit about Brandon Road, just to kind of orient yourself. So this is Brandon Road Lock and Dam, and you can see the dam, the dam is up in the upper left, and the lock chamber is down um, in the yellow. Um, there are a couple of things that the Brandon Road study recommended. First of all, there were a lot of non-structural measures that it um, recommended, those measures that had already been kind of incorporated into those Asian Carp Action Plans, but were then being refined specifically for this one site. So, you know, more aggressive monitoring of this area for Asian Carp, more aggressive netting to try and thin out the numbers, the populations of Asian Carp, um, and, uh, and the, use of potential, the potential use of piscicides and other toxins to try and kill off some of the fish. Um, but it also provided um, a recommendation for structural measures, um, re-engineering the channel in which the barges transit um, through the lock chamber, and that's that yellow, um, providing an opportunity to kind of plug in different technologies um, that could be used as deterrents for Asian carp. So for example, an acoustic fish deterrent, um, some call the uh, disco bubbler, because it has lights and sounds and bubbles. Um, another electric dispersal barrier, um, and then a flushing lock, which was designed to use pulses of water to push the fish um, back and out of the lock chamber when barges enter it. So as I already noted, the, the, this has taken a long time to get to this. This is the rec final recommended plan by the Army Corps of Engineers that they have now asked for the public to comment on. Um, we hope that they can wrap that process up because we feel like we need, they need to move forward quickly in order to allow for Congress to do its job, which is to authorize the construction of all this at this particular site. So they need to get the study done. They need to get funding in order to take to the next step um, if they're going to be able to meet their, dead, their, deadline, their internal deadline of completing all of this, this project by March of 2027. So. This is kind of where we're at. Moving forward, I already mentioned a couple of things, um, including the completion of the Brandon Road study so Congress can act. Uh, we need to appropriate, they need, the Congress needs to appropriate the funds for pre-construction engineering and design of Brandon Road, so there's a blueprint that the Corps can use um, in its construction. Just to give you a little bit of um, insight into what that's gonna cost, just PED alone for this project has been estimated to be $30 million over three years. I personally don't know if the Army Corps does anything cheap, um, but they do tend, so, but it's, yeah, they say it's gonna be $30 million over three years. Um, they need, they, um, the first year is gonna cost $5.8 million total, although only $3.8 million. The Brandon Road study, we have to fund, you know, taking it to the next step, which is to design it. Um, we also need to continue to fund all of those ex extra steps um, being, that were recommended by the Asian Carp Action Plan because those steps are still continuing to provide at least a little bit of a buffer um, for us. Uh, and a couple of other things I'll just throw out there, you know, just making sure that we get that Brandon Road study authorized by Congress so we can begin to move to construction. You know, what I did not mention, um, but as part of the research that's been done, they have actually discovered that small fish can get entrained between the barges as they move through the electric barrier, basically hit, hitchhiking. Um, somehow the electric field doesn't get up in there, um, and so they just take a ride through. Um, no one thinks that there has, that has happened, but they've now seen that it could happen, and so there have been navigation protocols that have been developed in order to address that problem, so those need to be implemented quickly. And then we also, because as I noted, Brandon Road only is for Asian carp. You know, as you all know here, there are aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes that can still go west. And so we still need to deal, and then there are other invasive species in the Mississippi River Valley and other places that can still go east. And so we still need to try and look at, you know, what next steps we can take to try and actually solve the problem. Maybe not physically reseparating the systems, but somehow virtually separating them to keep aquatic invasive species, all aquatic invasive species from migrating back and forth. 
So I covered a lot of territory. That is my contact information for those of you that would like to stay in touch. And um, I, you know, there's a lot going on, and I would be very happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. You mentioned that there's been a particular presence found near the Great Lakes, yet there was no signs of any breeding population uh, near our Great Lakes. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more. Should we be concerned about the presence of grass carp like our, you know, the other Asian carp species? And what are some of the effects that the grass carp could have in comparison with the silver and big head carp? Yeah, I think I can definitely answer the first part of that question and I can get information about what some of the impacts are for, for grass carp as compared to silver and big head. But the, the answer is yes, we should be compared. Um, what I know is that they have found, most grass carp seem to be found in Lake Erie. Um, uh, and I, as I understand it, these fish eat grass. Um, and so they, um, so the potential for them to devastate kind of uh, habitat where that is a, where there is a can be can be quite uh, could, can be quite devastating, um, and so yes, I think we have to be very concerned. I'm not a biologist, and so I would definitely want to get more specific information about um, the specific um, impacts that they could have. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. I know there are people in the audience that would like to know more about the funding. Split and also, what states have agreed, or do you think will agree, to participate in a 35% non-federal fund? Right. Um, the cost share issue is is a complicated one because it is dictated by federal law. As I already noted, because the project is in a federal kind of navi navi navigable waterway um, and it deals with federal locks and dams. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is the primary um, federal agency that um, is involved, and the Army Corps' rules and regulations are dictated by federal laws. And in this case, the kind of project that they are um, implementing has, I believe it's a 65-35 um, federal, non-federal cost share um, that is required, both for the pre-construction engineering and design work, but also the construction of it as well. Um, in certain circumstances, uh, that cost share has been waived. For example, the electric barriers. The electric barriers were constructed at full federal expense, and we actually believe because of the regional um, threat um, that this should be a regional project, and thereby the cost share should ultimately be waived, and no one state should bear the responsibility of having to pay for all of that, since all of us will be the beneficiaries of that work. Regardless, those laws have not been changed, and so we do have a, we do have a cost share requirement. The state of Illinois is the non-federal sponsor, and so right now the state of Illinois would be responsible for providing the non-federal share. Now, that doesn't mean that other states aren't interested. Um, Michigan has been the state um, that has proven to be the most aggressive um, in terms of its um, willingness to participate um, both in a non-financial and a financial way uh, to, to address these issues. Um, and so they have actually volunteered some money in its budget um, to the state of Illinois to help cover some of the operational costs for managing Brandon Road once it's constructed. Um, it's a little bit unclear whether or not that money has actually been accepted or not. There's been, a, as you probably noted from the past election, there's new governors now um, in Illinois. Um, the prior administration wasn't as receptive to additional help. This administration, I think, looks to be more receptive. Um, and so how it will how this new government in Illinois will respond to other states and their, it's, their overtures for help is still, it may be clearer than I know at the moment. I know a lot of our partners um, have been reaching out to state gov new state governments and really encouraging them to be active partners, both in a non-federal way, uh, but also through kind of a fiduciary commitment um, um, to helping fund this because Illinois is right now has to bear the brunt of all of it. Um, and so we're trying to relieve some of that. Um, and hopefully, if we're successful, Congress will also, like I said, recognize that this is a regional project and probably should be taken on at full federal expense and not leave it to just one state to have to 
have to deal with this issue. Is that I? Okay. Thanks for your presentation. Um, we know that a lot of invasive species have been introduced to this area through ballast water discharge of ships. I'm wondering if young carp, um, if that's a threat vector for young carp as well. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I just don't know if they are, I mean, first of all, there's no carp in the Great Lakes, so they nothing to worry about. Oh, these Asian carp, um, where they would get in, sucked up into ballast tanks of laker vessels at this point. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I think I, the, the issue with the other invasive species is their interaction with carp should they get in, and what will be the new dynamic between something like a zebra mussel or a quagga mussel um, and an Asian carp um, that comes in and does whatever it does to the environment. I mean, we already have an environment that's been highly altered because of these other invasive species, and you start introducing new invasive species into the environment, and who knows what the ultimate outcome would be. Oh, right here. This one? Yeah. Uh -huh. I just want, I, I'm thinking about disco lights and things like that. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I can imagine any species who wants to go somewhere is going to figure out disco lights after a while. Um, why is this a good plan? Yeah, I joke. I don't actually think the, the, the disco light plan is, I, I don't. I'll have to go back and look at more specific. I don't think that element got into this. I think the point I was trying to make is that the engineered channel that they're designing would allow for new technologies to be kind of plugged in over time. So they are looking at, uh, I believe, an acoustic deterrent. Um, um, but hopefully the engineered channel will also allow, as new technologies come online, for them to plug in. Why is this the best plan? Um, well, it's the one we've got. <laughs> um, I think it also integrates uh, a number of um, things that I think when taken together will, will pr produce greater redundancy and prevention. Um, it's also being done and proposed at a, at, a bare, at a place where there is some natural, because of the natural height of the dam that's already there, the fish cannot naturally get over it. So they all have to go through that one channel anyways. And so focusing our efforts on technologies um, there um, makes the most sense. What would be most protective? Probably closing that lock. Why not? Well, you have to ask the politicians about that um, because transportation is a, still a very important um, constituency in the state of Illinois and produces a large economic value for the region. And um, there's always, I mean, most people have decided that they want to keep transportation moving. Um, so that is, that is a policy question and a political question that um, seems to have been resolved with the answer being that transportation will continue. And if that is indeed the decision, then you get something like this in the back. Well, as you saw on the maps that I had up there earlier, they are spreading throughout the waterway systems, primarily in the Mississippi River Basin. I don't know of any distribution, like in the Colorado River Basin, where you see, see like zebra mussels and quagga mussels spreading. Um, but I imagine the potential for that spread uh, was higher. I will note that the um, interstate, uh, interstate um, transport of these fishes um, is restricted now, both by state and federal law. Many of these Asian carp species under the Lacey Act, um, it restricts their trans interstate transportation. And so um, their distribution and their transportation has been restricted. Um, and so what I, you know, I think what we're seeing now is more of a natural migration um, occurring than a human one, although it is, it is you raise 
interesting point. Um, human distribution is also something that has to be considered and, and dealt with. And because of the federal and state restrictions, there is a law enforcement component um, that is involved where you know people are watching for and looking out for the, the distribution of, of these Asian carp um, in bait buckets and in other places. Um, there are some, some places where they do eat them for food, and so they do look at, um, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the economic kind of uh, trade um, and to try and, re to try and reduce it as much as possible so we don't have some sort of accidental release into the public. You know, even though 10 males and 10 females doesn't sound like a lot, you know, it's still more than one, and so at least there's some, there's that. So. Are they still being imported? Oh, sorry, no, I don't believe they are still being imported. I think they are restricted from, from further importation. I think there was a, back here. Uh, Chad, you mentioned that uh, most of the annual budget is for electricity for power. And it's almost seven million bucks a year, I think I heard you say. Is there a backup plan to supply power to that if there's a long term outage? I don't know about a long term outage. Um, that is an interesting question and I, I don't I I visited the barrier system and I'm they do have generators, diesel operated generators. Um, so if there is a loss of power they do have backup. Um, I doubt that it's probably a good backup system for any term of type of long term long term outage. But they have they have planned for at least short term ones. Just one more? Okay. I think there was a hand over here. And there are native uh, place in China has there been successful efforts to control our spread? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, since they're native in China, I, 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 I would have to, I don't know if they would even think about their spread in, in, in terms of invasiveness. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what, how they're viewed in, in Asia. Thank you, Chad. You bet. Thank you, everybody. So Chad's going to be around to answer any questions you have. He is the most informed person that I've talked to on the Asian carp. And it's, you know, it's a significant problem. There are petitions on your table to uh, block Asian carp being sent to legislators. So I hope you'll take a minute to sign that. I'll also tell you that Save the River sent in its comments of support for this plan to the Corps of Engineers before Christmas. And a lot of the larger groups are waiting to send theirs in for another couple of weeks, hoping to have the time to educate and persuade the new governors and legislators that have been elected and hope they'll get stronger comments to the Corps. And this is an issue that we're gonna be looking to all of you for, for support as it tries to go through Congress. Hopefully it gets through there. And then the next step, at least as far as Save the River is concerned, is try to get New York State, which is a Great Lakes state with a lot of shoreline, to uh, step up and help support and pay for part of that 35 percent.